Hustling is a season, it's not a business strategy. What is the difference between people who produce very favorable outcomes and people who don't? He said risk tolerance. The thing is, when you're innovating, you're gonna be criticized until you're right. First they laugh at you, then they call you crazy, then they say you're a crook. Then you know what they do? They call you for advice. You wanna get paid in the future, you need to live in the future. So you need to get really good at something and What's going on, Wealth Builders? Today, I've got somebody special. He is a real estate agent. Now, before you try and leave, okay? You know, I know I hate on real estate agents a lot, but I like what this guy is doing for many reasons. Number one, he's not just an agent, okay? Even though his credentials as an agent are incredible, he sold over 2,000 homes um, in a very short period of time. He's built a big downline, so he's got that stream of income. He's invested millions as an LP in syndications, so we'll talk about that. And he's also gone through our Wealthy Creator program and building his presence online and just making it happen. So I got none other than Aaron Novello. What's up, man? What's up, brother? Appreciate uh, being here with you. Yeah. Thanks for coming, man. For sure. So you guys are here for EXP Con. Correct. And now you're now you're at the studio, dude. I am. Yeah. Is this your first time at the studio? It's the first time, yes. Okay. And where are you coming out of? Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. Nice, dude. Yeah. So, I mean, look, dude, you've got an impressive track record as a realtor. I mean- I, I like that you're actually just saying, hey, I'm going to focus on my craft and do it really good. And I'll just go invest my money into syndication so yes. I can just keep building my business. I think a lot of people um, need to take that path, especially when they're a high income earner, because I see a lot of high income earners who are like, hey, I'm going to go buy a rental property. And then they go spend like hundreds of hours researching one rental property. It's going to go yeah. make them 200 bucks a month. It, precisely. So I think that it's like an issue of focus. And what I believe to be true is like the average human has like 27,550 days on planet earth. It's about 75 years in the industrialized world. Women have a tendency a little bit more than men, but that's what's average. So as somebody who's entrepreneurial, you see money everywhere and there's 10 out of 10 opportunities everywhere. So I have to make an intentional, conscientious, purposeful decision about what to stack my time on top of. And what I realized is that I don't believe that people should focus primarily on their investments, the majority of people, until their investments produce more income than their earned income. Okay. And that's, for the most part, most people. So by staying completely dialed in and focused to selling real estate in high volume, I would st store and invest about 50% of all the income I was earning into assets that pay me money because I saw that as uh, the vehicle to create freedom. And I'm aware that that works. It takes a while, but it does work. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, allows me to just be 100% focused on, on what it is that I'm doing instead of getting distracted with duplexes or other yeah, things. Yeah. And I always wanted access to the investment vehicle of real estate. I think what's also true is people have to know their natural disposition. Some people are not, their natural disposition isn't to like manage or maintain or all that other stuff. And I wanted access to the vehicle. And after I sat with it for a while, I had enough cash at one point to buy my own building. Mm -hmm. But I recognized like I, I, I really didn't want to do that. I wanted to just push it over to let's say a professional investor like yourself or like Grant or like other people. Yep. Be the money guy and just get distributions and get no phone calls. <laughs> yeah. No, nothing. You know yep. what I mean? Yeah. I, a lot of people, man, and this, since I have these talks all the time, because I'm in a weird position where I teach real estate investing, and that's like what I'm always trying to get people to do, to learn on their own. But then there is the side where, you know, we have Pineda Capital and we raise money. And people ask me, they're like, well, what, what path should I go? Should I learn to do it myself or should I invest with you? And usually my answer is, hey, if you're not making any money, well, you probably can't invest with me anyway. Like, yeah. you, just, you just don't have the money to do it. Yeah. So number one, definitely go to the education side. Let's teach you how to flip, wholesale, make active income. But the moment you're starting to make really good money, multiple six figures, um, especially if you become an accredited investor, mm -hmm. then I'm like, well, you've got some choices. Like if your income is made through real estate, then maybe you're going to just start buying your own deals. You could do that. Okay. Most realtors aren't very good real estate investors. No. They're just good salespeople. So I'm like, if you're a realtor, it probably makes more sense to just give it to a syndicator, like you said. Um, but if you're not in the real estate industry, man, this is where I like draw the line. And I'm like, hey, if you're making all your money in content or you're making all your money in some random industry, you trying to go learn real estate and yeah. manage one property and do all that stuff is not smart. You yes. should just do your core business, 
give it to somebody you trust and just keep focus on making more money with your core business. Yeah. And to your point, I think if you're not at the accredited level, like let's say making $250,000 a year and have done that continuously for a few years, all of the money should be invested in yourself. Yes. To get to a place where you're earning enough income where you can actually have enough to store somewhere. Yeah. And then from the uh, syndicator's perspective, again, do I give up some return? Sure. Do I give up some tax advantages because I'm an LP and not a GP? Mm -hmm. Yes. What I'm gaining is time. Yeah. And with that time, I can pour that into other things that will make me much more money over time. And what I've learned is, is in order to, in my opinion, having like $10,000 a month in residual income for most people will pay for housing, transportation, food, and insurance. You will be financially free and independent mm -hmm. and no longer have to work specifically for money, but just for impact or because it is valuable to you or you enjoy it in some way. And to be able to get to that place, it's if I'm spending a lot of my time trying to um, get involved with investing instead of my craft, I think that it, it becomes a distraction. Oh, no, one, 100%. People just have the false narrative that they need to start investing now. Immediately. Right away. And I'm like, dude, you're broke, okay? Yeah. <laughs> you don't need a, a rental property. Yeah. Trust me, yeah. okay? You're actually gonna probably get foreclosed on because you're broke. Yeah. So let's take a step back and worry about just crafting, you know, or, or honing our skills and our craft so that, you know, we can start making some good active income. Yeah, and I think people think that the mechanism to financial freedom is your the type of assets you hold or how you hold them. Mm -hmm. It's really your income. Yeah. It's the main like it's the most powerful thing that you have to build wealth. Mm -hmm. And what I've recognized is that if you can learn and make yourself valuable to the point where you can earn a meaningful amount of money, if you can get a couple million dollars working at six, 7%, yeah, you're it good. starts to add up. It starts to quick. add up. And then you can, uh, again, once housing, transportation, food, and insurance is covered, now you can be more bold in your decision-making. Yeah, You could be more bold with choices or vehicles that you're gonna get involved in, or hey, I'm gonna do this content thing and I wanna go full out. I no longer have to worry that my family's lifestyle is gonna change one bit. Yeah. So let's talk about time management and opportunity costs, because that's kind of what you're referring to. And you know, before we, we jumped on this podcast, I was given your boy over there, Jose Luis, who was on an episode a couple of years ago. Yeah. You get, we'll link to that down below. but. Uh, you know, you both are in a similar boat. You both yep. are top producing agents. Mm -hmm. You both are in EXP. Mm -hmm. You're the only reason he has any kind of downline at all. Yeah. Because you're in and doing all the work. Yeah. But nonetheless, um, you guys are both doing education as well. Correct. You both are investing in syndicate. I mean, you guys are like pretty much doing the same thing. Correct. Right? Where with all those different income streams do you focus your time at? Yeah. So there's two mental maps that have radically changed the way that I think. And until recently, truthfully, I had a rudimentary understanding of leverage. I thought I knew what leverage was. I didn't. And the two pieces of information, one came from the almanac of Naval, Ravikant, mm -hmm. where he talks about the four forms of leverage. And at the bottom is uh, labor. And it's the lowest form of leverage because labor gets sick, it gets tired, it quits, it wants more money, you know, goes to a competitor, that sort of thing. But it's better than having no leverage. The second highest form of capital, it, it, as it goes up, it gets more powerful, is capital. Capital works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and it doesn't get sick, doesn't get tired, right? And those are the two pieces of leverage or forms of leverage that over the last couple hundred years, major institutions and individuals have used to create massive wealth. Because eventually, if you have enough capital, you can buy all the labor you need. Well, there's these two new forms of leverage that are available that within the last 30 years, all of the most richest people on planet Earth use and it they did it in 30 years where it took other people 200 years because mm -hmm. they're that much more powerful and that's content which is your game mm -hmm. which is media because that works 24 hours a day seven days a week with no geographic borders or boundaries so if i put money into a building it works 24 hours a day seven days a week in a building but it's limited in its capacity if i put it in to content that works 24 hours a day seven days a week wherever there's an internet connection and what most people don't realize what the real value is, is that the audience compounds. Yeah, for sure. Because as the audience compounds, you can service that. And you're a perfect example of that. So that's the second, uh, the third highest form. And the highest form is software. Mm -hmm. It's code. Yeah. Because code has no geographic borders or boundaries either. 
And it also costs almost no money to duplicate or replicate once it's been created once. Mm -hmm. So if you look at all the richest people on planet Earth, Larry Ellison, Oracle, Code, Zuckerberg, Code, Tesla, Code, right? Entrepreneurs, if you want to grow your business, there is no better investment than your own personal brand. The smartest thing I ever did was start creating content and investing into my brand. Ever since then, we've been able to triple our business. I've been able to raise more money than ever to continue buying more real estate. And it's all because I create content just like this. Now, a lot of people have asked me, Ryan, how am I supposed to do it? I don't know where to start. I don't know who's gonna edit it. I don't know even what kind of setup or camera or anything to do. Well, here's the thing. We can help you with all of that at Pineda Media. We have a podcast checklist that you can actually get for free at PinedaMedia.com that's going to go over everything you need on starting a podcast. But to make matters even better, we'll actually edit your podcast for you. We'll repurpose it into short form clips like you see on my Instagram and my TikTok so that people will start seeing those clips and watching your podcast and in turn being customers or investors in your business. So if you want the one-stop solution where you can get everything done for you, plus get the education you need to grow your personal brand, then you need to go to PinedaMedia.com and book a free call with our team. You can also go get that free podcast checklist and that training program absolutely free by just going there. So go check it out. That was the first mental map that caused me to take pause and be like, hey, this is a pattern. And I believe that if you want to create favorable outcomes, you need to recognize patterns and then use them. The second piece of information came from Hermosi because there's a five-minute clip on YouTube where he talks about the opportunity ladder. And when I started to really think about that, and the example he gives is like, let's say you work at a, a laundromat and you do laundry. It's like, well, do you have any leverage? No. Then it's like, all right, well, let's say you manage a laundromat. A little bit of leverage, but not much. Let's say you own the laundromat. You only have one form of leverage, which is labor. And you're, that opportunity now is limited in capacity because you can only serve people within a 15 mile radius, right? Then let's say you franchise a laundromat. Now I have another form of leverage, which is capital. I can use other people's money to build out other, uh, you know, um, laundry mats. And because I've added another form of leverage, now I can do it anywhere across the country. And it turned a million dollar opportunity to a hundred million dollar opportunity. Then let's say you create software for laundry mats that makes them more um, profitable, more efficient. And all you do is take a small, tiny rip, like two pennies off, you know, gross sales. Well, now because you've added that highest form of leverage you took of who can you serve everyone on planet earth and you took a one a hundred million dollar opportunity turned to a billion dollar opportunity mm -hmm. so i started to ask myself questions right i was like all right what's the equivalent of doing laundry in real estate doing deals mm -hmm. so now i mess with jose all the time I'm like hey bro, are you doing laundry you want me to send you some detergent right what's the equivalent of managing a laundromat having a team mm -hmm. what's the equivalent of owning a laundromat owning an office i used to own part of an office right yeah so owning an office, you're limited in capacity, you have only labor, and it's a limited opportunity. What's the equivalent of franchising? Those are these large franchises like Keller Williams, Century 21, they take a small franchise fee and they do, it's top line revenue, yeah. which is rev share, mm -hmm. and they can do it all across the country. Mm -hmm. But then I started to ask myself, what's the equivalent of software? Mm -hmm. What is software that you can plug into to do transactions? Because all brokerages are, are really just platforms to process transactions with some kumbaya and some handholding. Mm -hmm. And what I realized is that cloud-based brokerages like eXp, it's just software. Because for 150 bucks and $85 a month, you could plug into the software anywhere on planet earth. So as I looked at those two, I realized, oh, I'm not doing the media piece. That's mm -hmm. why I got in contact with you and yep. your team. Yep. Because I recognized the pattern. Then I recognized, oh, doing deals is the lowest form. I'm on the lowest part of the opportunity ladder. Yep. And I was at a place in my life at 42, like my kids are 13 and 10. I wanted to reclaim time because yeah. traditional success in our business is working 70, 80 hours a week. And you pound on your chest gross in like a million five, but your net is like, you know, after expenses is not that much. Mm -hmm. And you're sacrificing a lot mm -hmm. to do that because there's no way around it. There's only so much time in a day. So as I looked at all of that, got clear on why I wanted to do what I wanted to do to climb the, up the opportunity ladder and to use media, it became very clear to me that the highest and best use of my time is attraction mm. because it's the most leveraged thing that I can do, period. Where 
if you like people that are really uh, wealthy, they get paid multiple times for doing something once. So like I've personally brought, let's say 40 people into the company, but those 40 have went out and got like 150, let's say 155. So that's like, like a multiple of three X, four X. And as it builds out, it'll be 25 X, 30 X, right? And I ask myself a question because there needs to be a filter to decide what's worth my time. The first one is, is does it compound and is it leveraged with those two mental maps? If the answer is no, it goes away. I don't even look at it anymore. The second is, is a filter. Can I make at least a million dollars a year doing this? If the answer is no, it's not worth my time. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested because there's a lot of people call me, guy called me yesterday to create like a flipping company. And I'm like, look, dude, I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm not interested in that at the moment. I know I can make money doing that, but it's not leverage and it doesn't compound. It's mm -hmm. just a mechanism to raise cash. And I don't, I'm not really interested in that at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So once I put it through those two filters, then I ask myself a question. Let's say I have two left, right? Two opportunities. Now the question is, what is most in alignment with my natural disposition? And let's say like my gift or my ability. And then two, which will allow me to have the biggest impact. Mm -hmm. That's the one I pick. Yeah. And for me, that's this. So I, so that's then once I pick that, now I have to have the intestinal courage and fortitude to push everything into it. Mm -hmm. Because if I do three things at one time, you know, I think my wife told me the other day and I chuckled. I think people would, she's like, I think people would rather own three businesses that don't make money than one that does. <laughs> because it's yeah. just ego. Yeah. You're like, ah, bro, I own, own like three, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and then it's having the intestinal fortitude to continue to say no over an extended period of time. It's sticking like V over T, volume over time. So I know the same way I know the sky is blue and the grass is green. If I stay doing this for the next five years, I can make a million dollars a year residually, yeah. which is the equivalent of $20 million invested at 6%, right. which in order to get 20 million, I'd have to gross 40 or 50. Mm -hmm. How many people on planet earth will ever in their lifetime gross that amount of money? It's infinitesimally small, but this vehicle, because of the fact that it's super high up the opportunity ladder, and it's using the leverage allows me to do that in a very short period of time. Mm. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, first off, let me say, I've never heard a realtor talk about Naval. Um, so you'll be the first yeah. that I've heard that because uh, most realtors are, you know, like you said, they're focused on just making sales, doing labor, trading time for commissions. And, you know, if they're lucky, they learn how to manage labor and build a team. Mm -hmm. And so they still kind of stay at that level one opportunity. Yeah or level one leverage, as he would call it. And, you know, they're happy, right? I think that realtors, I don't even want to talk about realtors. Anyways, <laughs> so anyways, that like that's kind of like the benchmark. You know, if you yeah. could go make a couple hundred thousand as a realtor, you're balling, killing it. Everybody yeah. loves you. Well, you start ascending up the ladder and you start to realize like, man, there's these new opportunities. What's that look like? And, you know, the same thing happened for me. When I first started, I was a realtor, yeah. right? And eventually I started flipping couches and that's labor. I was like, dude, I'm making good money doing this, right? And then I traded for a new labor, which was flipping houses, houses and, you know, made a million bucks doing that. And I'm like, wow, this is great. You know, we're doing this, doing labor. I added capital to the mix, obviously. Mm -hmm. That allowed me to buy more houses and scale the business. So I was getting good at the first two. And then around the pandemic, I learned that, man, content is king. Yes. We have to start doing this. And so I started making content during the pandemic and I've seen the fruits in my own life, how much it keeps compounding year over year, the opportunities it presents, everything else that comes with it. And yeah, you know, tech becomes that fourth layer yeah. and, you know, we got a, you know, a few different tech things going on. Um, I'm an owner and a few that I don't publicly talk about, but yeah, tech is huge, man. And yeah. so when you're able to utilize, and we're trying to add tech into our different companies too, to keep customers more sticky sure. and enhance the overall value of the company with tech. So totally agree with all those points, man. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, okay, obviously you're talking about EXP being one of those opportunities with um, getting to that fourth level, maybe one of the only opportunities in real estate, right? I agree. Um, and I, and I just look at, let's just say for real estate agents, Zillow was probably like the biggest example of a, a tech company doing it and making yeah. it happen. Um, and they, you know, they tried to go actually go downgrade yes. and get capital and flip and do all this crap. Yes. And they realized like, man, why did we just do that? Yeah. We, we were making so much money just running ads. It was crazy. Yeah. And selling leads 
to agents for like 33%, yeah. which is insane, yep. right? And I think what, what I became aware of as I started to think and marinate on this more, because I mean, you know this, cause you're uh, you know wildly successful business owner, is that business is about outmaneuvering people. And it's about recognizing patterns and then having the courage to use them, right? So one of the other things I began, as I started to think about this and combine the opportunity ladder with Naval, I realized that cloud-based brokerages like eXp, they're just YouTube. So YouTube went to their content creators in 2007 or eight, whenever it was. And they said, hey guys, we recognize something. We need you because we have a platform, but we don't exist without you. We need content. So we're gonna create a symbiotic relationship that's win-win. Meaning we will give you, if you have a thousand subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time, we will give you a portion right? Of all the revenue that we generate from ads on your content, like 50, 55%. Mm -hmm. Now, the first question is, is, is that a scam? The answer is no. That's an economic model called revenue sharing. And it caused YouTube to become the second largest search engine in the world at record speed. Google, who was the first, looked at that and said, we can't have that. So they bought YouTube as a mm -hmm. competitor. Well, what eXp says is they say, hey guys, if you bring agents to our platform, and that's all brokerages are, just platforms to process transactions, and they sell any real estate, we will give you a small portion of the $16,000 cap that they send back to us. That's YouTube. Mm -hmm. And YouTube made 15 year olds millionaires. Mm -hmm. And that's the opportunity. So I firmly believe for agents, if that's their main mechanism for earning cash, they have no other opportunity for building wealth that's bigger than that. But how do you build a downline? Yeah, so here's the interesting part of that because people come for the money, but they stay for the relationships. And the other thing I know is true is that it's relationships plus value over time. Most people think it's just relationships. Do you know me? But the issue is, is you have to add value, tremendous amounts of value, way more than others. Because in the end, what I'm aware of is whoever adds more value wins. But how do you add value? If you are trying to grow your real estate investing business, then you need to join us at Wealthy Investor. You have no idea what Wealthy Investor is. It is our coaching program and community. We have helped thousands of students worldwide grow their business. Now, it doesn't matter if you're just getting started and you're trying to get that first deal. We can help you do that. If you're trying to scale your business and go from a few deals a year to a few deals a month or even seven figures a year, we can help you do that too. In fact, last year alone, we had over 30 students do over a million dollars in revenue. And I'd love for you to be the next one. So it's pretty simple. If you're trying to grow your business and wholesale more homes or flip more homes or buy more rental properties, then you need to go to wealthyinvestor.com and book a free call with our team. It's super simple. We'll go on a strategy call with you and figure out how we can help you grow according to your needs. So all you got to do is go to wealthyinvestor.com, book the free call with the team, and we'll see you there. So the way you add value is you find out from agents specifically what do they need and what are they missing, right? And the, the nitty gritty of our industry is 70% of agents within their first year are out. Mm -hmm. And 80% within five years are gone. And you start to ask yourself, well, why is that? Well, the reason is, is because the mechanism for getting a license has nothing to do with actually making money. So the barrier to entry is a thousand bucks. Uh, you got to get a C on a test and you're not a felon yet. Yeah. That's the barrier. Mm -hmm. So you have a whole industry that is woefully undereducated on how to actually sell real estate in high volume. I get, I get the education part of adding value, but how do you get people aware of you? Oh, media. So content's oh, the way. Well, media and so, okay. So there's two ways. If you think you can do high tech without high touch, you're wrong because it's a people business. Mm -hmm. So you have to connect with people. You have to spend time with them. You guys do meetups all the time. There's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. You mix tech with touch yes. at a high level. Yeah, You get that. So I understand that too. So what we're doing is uh, there's a double pronged approach. So you think about it like every business has a track, convert, deliver, right? You need attraction mechanisms, you need conversion mechanisms, then you need delivery mechanisms. The attraction mechanism is inside the database, outside the database. So inside the database is any agents that you know, you've co-broke deals with, you have relationships with, right? You've met at events, fine. Uh, outside the database are things like lunch and learns. So lunch and learns serve four purposes. One is you're training your existing team. Two is recruitment. Three is content, because I have a videographer there. Four is culture. 
right? So you're doing a bunch of these lunch and learns. I do. I do a lunch and learn every month locally, and I do a webinar locally. Now every month, every month. And why do, why do you do the webinar locally? And then, no, I'm sorry. So <laughs> the, yeah, the, the lunch and learns. Okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. And so that's the high touch, right? We also do socials once a quarter. Yep. Brings people together. And we're doing a gala. It's the first one at the end of the year where we're all the elite builders are flying in, some of the top people in the organization. We're going to have talks, like, you know, all that stuff. A black tie event, pool party. Elite builders end. like the coaching? Or well, the elite builders, the organization within EXP. Got it. Yeah. And uh, so that's the high touch part. That's the culture part, right? And so we're doing that on a regular basis. And then what I'm also combining with that is we're posting three to four times a day, every day on all platforms, seven days a week. And we're also doing six YouTube videos per month because what I've learned from you guys is frequency equals familiarity. And what I learned from Grant is if you don't know me, you can't flow me. Dude, you, you got like me. a million sayings. Yeah. You, did you, do you have a philosophical background? No. Okay. No, I just, the most philosophical, can we rebrand you? I don't know what <laughs> Dustin's trying to help you get branded as, but yeah. I'm going to rebrand you as like the, the modern day realtor. If Socrates was a realtor. There you go. There you go. So, um, I'm just aware that, uh, that's part of the formula. Yeah. And that's why, so we're pumping in both of those hard. Okay. Yeah. So the reason I was kind of getting at that is because, you know, adding value to people is how you get them. It's like, well, duh. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes two things. One is, how do you get people aware of the value that you can provide? Yep. Two, how do you build credibility to even be listened to? Yeah. And I think the challenge is, is and this is a challenge like you probably have with people who go through content creator, is that it's both. You need to be competent. I think we live in a time where you don't have to be competent in order to be famous. No, no, you don't. And that's a problem. <laughs> and that's a problem because it's very difficult for people to decipher who's full of shit and who's not. Yeah. So well, if you're in the, if you're in the like guru space, yeah, but you can be an idiot making funny videos and whatever and make yeah, a ton of money. A ton of money. Yeah. So um, if, if you're trying to position yourself as somebody who can add value, mm -hmm. you have to have substance. So for me, and this isn't to brag or boast, but it's just true. I've actually sold 2000 homes in my career. Right. And that's my point. And, and I can actually teach you tactical information. Not like, hey, Ryan, it's all mindset. Which when people say that, I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, yeah. you, you, could, you need to give me the tactical, practical, what do I say? How do I say it? What do I do? How do I build a system? How do I build a CRM? And because, you know, I spent 17 years of my career doing that, I can actually add that value to people. Yeah. You know what I do when I'm coaching is, and I was kind of doing it to our boy here without him knowing, is that the first thing I do is I ask a bunch of questions. Yeah. And I don't ask questions to like point things out or whatever. I ask questions to help people come to their own conclusion of the problem at hand. Yes. And the decision that needs to be made going forward. And if they can come to the conclusion versus me just saying, well, that's a dumb strategy. They're not going to listen. But if you ask the right question, and this is true for listings and sellers and yeah. everything else, if you help them come to the conclusion themselves that, yo, okay, there's that's a good point. I need to figure out, all right, what's this next path going to be? Then the second step becomes, all right, well, now that you're aware of the problem, here's the solution, right? It's it's not going to happen overnight, but you know, if you come down with me on this path, you know, whether it's by our education, by whatever, right? Then you're going to find out like how to fully execute the strategy. Yeah, and I think the highest form of selling is asking questions. And people don't do what you want, they do what they self-discover. Exactly. So it's helping people to self-discover, which is a skill though, because I think the way that we're trained to communicate is in statements. So when somebody approaches you and you're coaching your team without them knowing it, what most people would do who are lower level leaders or lower levels of communicating, they will just, this is what's wrong, here's how to change it. Yes. Which doesn't build people. So I noticed on the wall you had like, you know, building, leaders and stuff. And I think that's mm -hmm. awesome. Uh, and building leaders requires me helping you to self-discover where there's gaps, where there's inefficiencies, and then giving you options and choices as to how to solve those problems. Right. Because I'm equipping you then. Yeah. Exactly. So now you're no longer, because if I'm just there, like if I'm a, if somebody can be like a genius with minions where they have to like tell people things all the time, if you're doing that, nobody will ever be able to function without you being present. And you're not actually leading people. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. So 
This is something I've thought a lot about since we've been training people on content and real estate and everything else is I've realized in order for you to be successful at content, if you are going to be like in the education space, mm -hmm. well, obviously you need track record, right? Yeah. If you don't have track record, then you don't even know anything. You shouldn't be teaching, right? And so like we've had people who are like, well, I haven't done a lot. <laughs> and so what do I do? And I'm like, well, then you don't teach. Yeah. You just show what you're doing. Yeah. Like document the journey, talk yeah. about what you do know, sure. be transparent about what you know. Yeah. And that's all you can do right now. Are you going to grow at the rate that somebody who's super smart and has huge track record is going to grow? No, mm -mm. you don't deserve to. <laughs> yeah. You got to earn it. Yeah. And my point with that is, you know, a lot of people, um, especially if they're trying to like start coaching or start social media or build a downline, these are all things that for sure, long haul, great, great opportunities because they have high leverage. Yeah. But you have to also earn it in that you got to accomplish things for people to actually want to watch or join. So I guess like on the EXP side of things, you know, it's easy for you to recruit because yeah. you are who you are yeah, and you understand these things and yeah. you've accomplished these things. Sure. But what about a new agent? Great question. So you have to follow a system in which a dud can recruit a stud. So I think most agents approach this as a technician. So they're used to doing the work themselves. So they think I need to call an agent I need to invite them to a coffee and we need to have a conversation. And then they try to do all the heavy lifting. But I read a book uh, by a guy named Carruthers who built an organization with a network marketing, I think it was prepaid legal, of 300,000 people. And he gives you the blueprint. And what he tells you is, is like, look, it shouldn't be you. You should always be pushing away from you, pushing people to videos or to um, some sort of tool. Then the next step is to get them to an event, right? again, away from you. Mm -hmm. And then the next step is a third party call, which is where you have a senior partner who has more credibility than you because your friend may like you, but they don't trust you for a business opportunity. Right. So you need to introduce somebody and by um, edifying that senior partner, like, hey, this is Aaron. He sold 2000 homes. He's done this. That. Now you've transferred the trust to me and I'm, I'm influential. And now I can help that individual make a decision. So I think one of the things that agents think about as far as uh, like a, a flaw in thinking is that I need to be super productive before I can really, you know, go heavy or be intentional about attraction. I don't believe that that's true. I think that you need to follow a system that works. And what I'm doing now, because what I recognize is this is really about leadership and duplication. That's what it's really about. And the stronger the leadership, the faster the organization grows. So now what I'm doing is I'm hand selecting, hand picking people in the organization that I believe have the the capacity to lead and to build. And then what I do is I spend extra time with them. I find out what their dreams are, what their goals and objectives are. I find out what their weaknesses are, where they have, you know, maybe some insecurity about being on camera or insecurity about doing a talk or whatever. And then I equip them with the SOP on how to do a lunch and learn. I equip them with, hey, here's what I, I spent 8,000 bucks to learn this from Pete Vargas, how to do a talk. Here it is, right? He's coming tomorrow. <laughs> he's, he's awesome. So yep. I'm, I, I equip them with what they need. So now I'm duplicating myself mm -hmm. because people think that this is like one-to-one. -one. It's not. It's really, if you follow the system that I just described and you have uh, kind of senior partners that are building you as a leader, mm -hmm. then you can have 10, 15, 20 people doing lunch and learns every day. Right. And yeah. that's how it scales wildly. And that's specifically for recruiting agents. Specifically for recruiting yeah, agents. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So... With that being said, I mean, for you as an agent who's, you know, made millions of dollars as an actual agent, yep. where, how would you say you're dividing your time up now with the different opportunities available? Yes. So I'm only spending times with, with things that compound and are leveraged. No, I get that. Yeah. But if you had to quantify what percentage oh, of your okay. time. So I would say 40% of my time is spent on coaching and training and 60% on attraction. Attracting new agents. Yeah. So are you doing any production stuff anymore? No. Okay. So for the last seven months. Okay. Did you build out a team or what did months. you do? No. So here's what's interesting. I did the same thing that you, we were talking about off camera. So I looked at it and I realized I felt from a scarcity perspective, I grew up in a family that were super kind and nice, but lived paycheck to paycheck. So that has residual kind of effects and thinking. And I felt like a desire to 
um, preserve that stream of income, the, the residential resale side. But I recognized it was just a money grab. I didn't really have a heart for it. I wasn't like passionate about it. So I made the decision when I ran it through those filters of, is this compounding? Is it highly leveraged? And I was like, mm, not the most. Can I make a million dollars a year doing it? I could, but it would take a lot of time and energy and effort. And then three, uh, does it, it, will it allow me to use my gift or talent in a way that would impact the most people? And the answer was no, because it would only help me, truthfully. It might help a small group of people, but not as many as I could. Yeah. So what I did is I just let go of it. Mm -hmm. And what I did is for the partners that we have locally, I just give them like deals and leads as they come in. And I just take a small referral fee on those transactions. Got it. So you're just referring out all the leads that you would have generated. Correct. Got it. Yeah, that's easy. I mean, back when I uh, still was licensed, that's all I did. Yeah. I was just referring out anything I got. Sure. And it was easy. Yeah. So I guess my question is, you know, doubling down on content, doubling down on the message of recruiting and mm -hmm. coaching and everything else, um, it makes sense from like a scalability perspective. Um, I'll pose a counter argument, which I was going to make. And I was like, you know, what? just turn the camera on. We'll just make them live. Yeah. So it. I guess one of my counter arguments is even still with your skill set yeah. and, you know, with where you're at today, is that still the best use of time? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think at this moment it is. What I'm aware of, just like you, you probably have made decisions that this was a good use of time. And as time progressed, your values changed, what was important to you changed, and then you just make a decision like, hey, I'm gonna sell that business now. Mm -hmm. So I think at this moment it is, because I think that uh, for me personally, this was more like, like your comfort keeps you from your calling. Yeah. And I was comfortable. I, I made a good living. I made a lot of, you know, a meaningful amount of money for most. And I was able to create financial freedom and independence. Uh, but I feel like the thing that I'm greedy for is my name being in somebody's testimony. And I couldn't do it there. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I could help people buy and sell and that, that's meaningful and helpful, but this is much more impactful for me. Yeah. So at this moment, the answer is yes. Yeah. As time progresses, that may change. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was the same with flipping houses. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's like me going and closing deals and flipping houses ain't what I want to do. Right. I'm not passionate about it, but we still crush it. Yeah, you still so, do you know, well. We, we built it out and so it can run without me. Yes. Um, but that being said, like even for me, as I've thought about these next stages of what's my business and my life going to look like, it's like, man, okay, you know, we're doing the education thing. That's going well. We've started other businesses and they're going well. We've shut down other businesses that we thought were good and now we're not. So we're not worth the time, whatever the case is, right? We've sold businesses. And the more I think about it and the more experienced I get being around like these bigger name people, I've come to two conclusions. One is that yes, real estate is amazing, but it is, I would say, the easiest way to make money, both good and bad. So the reason I say it's easy is because it requires no special skills or talents. Mm -hmm. Anybody can flip houses. Anyone can sell. <laughs> Obviously, mm -hmm. just go get a C, spend a thousand bucks. You can yeah. become a realtor. Anybody could wholesale. There's not a ton of skill required. You don't need to be the, the smartest, the fastest, the strongest. There's nothing that makes it, I guess, um, proprietary. And so... It's great because guys like me have built a career getting in that industry because we had nothing else to do. And I knew, and I know many other and many of our students do the same. But as you kind of like go beyond that, you realize, oh, wow, like real estate has a lot of issues that other businesses don't. To your point, it's not content. It's not tech. Um, the capital, the cash conversion cycle takes forever. It takes a lot of capital to flip. There's a lot of risk, especially if you're flipping you know, with rental properties, you don't really make money, mm -hmm. you know, as far as cash flow goes, you make money on the appreciation and the mm -hmm. sale and the tax benefits and all that stuff. And even then you're like, all right, well, you know, I'm gonna sell this in five years and it doubled and that's great. Mm -hmm. But then as you get into the other world of business, you realize like, wow, these guys over here are making a lot more money doing these other businesses because number one, 
they can make money every single day like that, like yes. clockwork. You know, I have other businesses where we literally get paid every single hour. It's like, that doesn't happen in my house living business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like yeah. I'm waiting for that one big check, yeah. you know, whenever that is, right? So, you know, you get into these other businesses that have like way quicker conversion cycles. They can scale way faster yep. because they don't require so much capital, so much, you know, everything that real estate, labor, mm -hmm. real estate requires a ton of labor to go fix and flip. Um, and then two, and probably the most important one is when you actually build enterprise value of a business, it becomes far more valuable than any real estate asset. Correct. And so when I just think about like, okay, what do I want to put my time towards? I run it through a similar filter of, yeah, can this make me a million bucks plus a year? Yes, that's like definitely a minimum. But can I sell this business for at least Multiples. eight figures? Yeah. Right? Because if I can't, then I don't want to do it. So like I used to have a downline too. And I saw the same things you saw, but I was like, well, you can't sell this. Like freaking, yeah. what's the point? Like it, it, it is recurring, but at the end of the day, it's not something that is sellable. Mm -hmm. um, and it still requires maintenance nonetheless. Like sure. you said, you got to still nurture it and everything. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, I've been on YouTube now for three and a half years. And I think we just had our best month ever of AdSense. It was like 17 grand. <laughs> and I'm like, cool. Yeah, cool. You know, like, Thanks guys. <laughs> that was super worth it. It, it. It's worth it in the terms of everything it produced. It produced millions, but like the recurring revenue aspect of YouTube ain't anything. Well, and I think there's two components here. So the first one is, is like from a purely business practical perspective, like you're saying, which is you run it through filters. Is this worth my time? What's the most leverage? What can I sell at the biggest multiple? The second is, is I read a book called Die With Zero. Yep, I've read it. And that radically changed my thinking. I don't know if that had the experience with you, mm -hmm. but it did. And I had a mentor in my life who told me, he looked right at me and he's like, Aaron, you're going to die with a lot of money. And nobody had ever said that to me before mm -hmm. because I was still like running and racing, like hoping that that doesn't happen. And when he said that to me, he's like, hey, the game's no longer money, the game is time and impact. That's really what it is. Yeah. So it's it's using both of those filters. Yeah. I feel like, you know, definitely for someone like you at your, your level and you know what, what I'm doing, it's like, I use both of those filters to make decisions. Because yeah. sometimes I might make a decision that's not the most leveraged and the most optimal and yeah, the yeah. most this, but it's like, bro, this is about impact. Yeah. And I'm fine with that. Yeah. No, I thousand percent agree. And I think it changes as your, I guess, skill set and your opportunities change. So like for me, I never thought I would sell a business, you know, like it wasn't even on my radar to like flip businesses yeah. or anything. I'm like, dude, yeah, I flip houses and that's all good. And with the whole education side of things, which is what you're referring to, I'll never sell. Like it, for one, it's not even sellable because it's me. Yeah, it's you. Um, two, you know, people have sold education, but even if I could, I wouldn't yeah. because of one, I enjoy doing it, the impact, the events. Also, all of the opportunities and things that come from, you know, we got WealthCon this week. We have a thousand people there. Every single WealthCon, something happens. Mm -hmm. I get some big investor. I get some new business opportunity. I get some new partner slash employee that's going to be a game changer because I'm creating this environment to bring together like-minded people and we're going to just do something. And so to me, yeah, the event itself has a certain ROI, but the long-term impact of it compounds of whatever it is and building brand and, you know, all that other stuff. So, you know, I would never sell education, but being a guy who's now started a lot of businesses and knowing that I'm just going to keep continuing to start and acquire businesses in all the years to come, it now is like, all right, well, yeah, the game is on that side of things. Okay. Like we got to build these businesses to flip. Like yeah. we're not building these anymore for cash flow. No. Like we're going to get cash flow and all the other stuff we have. I ain't worried about that. Yeah. I'm looking for big checks. Yeah. We're building it for the exit. Yeah. Intentionally and purposely. Yeah. And with the end in mind. Correct. Which is, I think the highest form of that game. Yeah. And, and you've just progressed through that evolution yeah. way faster than most because people get stuck at certain levels. Most people get stuck at the real estate level. Yeah. That's why I'm like, man, dude, as a realtor, like hearing you think at this high of a level is impressive because most even high level, high earning realtors don't think that way because mm. they're just like, well, yeah, dude, I freaking make a million bucks a year as a realtor. I'm the best yeah. in my city. And I'm like, you are. What's next? Yeah. And they'll be like, well, I'll just keep selling houses. I'm like, 
So you're going to sell houses till you die. Yeah. You just, because a lot of those guys don't even buy rental properties. Mm -hmm. They don't invest. They just, I don't know what they do with their money, to be honest. Lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. 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 Lifestyle. And like, uh, you know, trying to impress people that don't care. Yeah. And I think there's also this thing. I think people confuse consuming big with thinking big. Those are two different things. Yeah. To, to me, thinking big is like trying to figure out. So I think a lazy mind's answer is to work harder. Yeah. And I think we as a culture have gotten like really deep into like hustle culture, which I think like, look, there's a thing to hustling. Like I know for you this week, you're yeah. going to work your ass off. Yeah. And you're not going to sleep that much. Yep. And you're- you, well, I got a newborn, so I don't sleep. You anymore. got a newborn. You don't sleep as much already. Yeah. Yep. So, but you know that. So like, I know there's something to working your ass off. Like, yes. I also think though that um, hustling is a season. It's not a business strategy. Yes. And people make it a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And like they get their identity from like, yo, I grind it out 70 days a week and blah, blah, blah. Where you're sitting next to a guy who does not do that and makes the same amount of money residually. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, what's different? And the difference is, is thinking. And I think you get paid to the level of your thinking. I agree with that. You know, it's, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking, you know, we talk about morning routines and everything a lot. And I've always said that the best ideas I've ever had have come during the morning. You know, when I'm praying, when yeah. I'm journaling, I'm reading my Bible. I'll just get inspired with all these ideas. Sure. And, you know, for me, yeah, thinking is what I spend way more time on than doing. I will literally never do anything like, like what you just said that doesn't have any kind of compound effect. Right. Like I will not go close a deal with a seller. No. I just won't do it anymore. Um, I will close a big business deal sure. or an investor because guess what? We're going to do more stuff together. Like mm -hmm. that has compounding effect. The one time house flip is done. Done. You know, we do it and it's done. So yeah, everything I do has got to compound. And you know, the cool thing too, about like, once you start thinking bigger and you experience new things is you start intertwining ideas yes. to, you know, monetize in multiple different ways. Yes. I was just telling Jose this, that as you immerse yourself, it's like a, it's like a, a door that you open. Yeah. And as you go through that door and you immerse yourself and you, you kind of allow your brain to look for patterns, mm -hmm. uh, over, as time progresses, you start to get clarity and insight Yeah, if you're paying attention. Mm -hmm. And with that clarity and insight, then I think the more clear you are, I think for most people and probably for most people that watch your podcast, the issue isn't getting what they want, it's knowing what they want. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Yeah. And they think they know what they want. I want to make a million bucks. I want a car. I want this. But then you get that and you're like, this is not it. Yeah. So it's really spending time. Like with some coaching clients, I might spend four months with them just getting clear on what they want. Yeah. And they might be like, while we're doing this, like, hey, bro, this is not really help. It's like, no, dude, this is really what it's about. Mm -hmm. Because once you have that clarity and you've really thought it through, you can um, co-create, right? With the creator. Yep. And you can put it into existence like immediately. So if I was to tell somebody, hey, like what if there was this being that could think something and make it real? What would you call that? God. Yeah. Well, it's like, I thought something and I made it real. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And and when when most people say like the kingdom, like you have wealthy kingdom. Yeah. When people say like the kingdom of heaven, they think like a geographic place. Mm -hmm. what, the Latin, what, what the Greek translation of that word is, it doesn't mean that. Yeah. What it means is royal power, royal control, and royal dominion. So if you hear that differently, it's like, dude, you have the royal power, royal control, royal dominion to co-create, mm -hmm. to make it here as it is there, mm -hmm. right? That's yep. a totally different message. Yeah. So by getting clarity on what you want, I think it uh, rapidly increases the speed with which you can make yeah. it real. Well, I just think like when it comes to doing work, so many people don't take the time to think, yeah. is there a better way to do this? Mm -hmm. Is there, you know, is this, should I be continuing to do this? Like we should always take, Right now, literally, the reason I was late to this podcast is we have our quarterly meetings every Monday. So my business coach, Gary Harper, comes in every quarter. He speaks at WealthCon and he comes in on Monday and we, every single business, talks about everything, making mm -hmm. sure we're all on the same page. And I realized like this quarter was the quarter we've had the most change in my entire career. Wow. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, which I could dive into, but the main one being you know, at the end of the day, like we're, we're about to reach a new level and what got us here won't get us there. And so I have to really look at certain things and say, does this fit anymore? Yeah. 
this has made maybe millions of dollars, but should we continue to do this yeah. this way? Um, and those are tough questions to answer. The other part of it is, in you know, the last 12 months, at least as a um, organization, have been the hardest 12 months of my business career, mainly because you know, you got a tough real estate market that affects all the house flips. I've lost millions of dollars on bad house flips. Really? You know, on the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, I've been able to make money too on ones that worked. But the point is, you don't plan to lose millions of dollars on mm -hmm. house flips. And so you got to deal with that. Um, you know, when the economy is tough, people spend less. That's across every business, um, especially when you're in real estate education. When, you know, you're shutting down different businesses and starting like this last 12 months for sure has been the most trying 12 months of my career. Mm. But also, too, when you go into it, um, it's the most time for growth, you know, like during COVID and stuff. You're just like, dude, freaking money's coming in everywhere. This is tight. Yeah. You don't really have to work on the process because money comes easier with the wind at your back. Yeah, I think I feel like when during that time we get high on our own supply. Mm hmm. So like what's working and we can start to imagine like it's always going to work. Yeah. Where I was talking to Jose about this, that the thing about business is it's perpetually nonstop, constantly changing. We want it to stay fixed. No, we, it ain't. We want it to be like, hey, I figured it out yeah. and I can ride this out for the rest of my life. The truth is, is if you want to continue to grow and expand, the answer is no. Yeah. You constantly have to be evolving, constantly have to be changing. If you would have met me three years ago and you would tell me that I now do webinars on social media, I would have laughed at you, <laughs> like legit yeah. laughed at you, right? So I think you can tell uh, if you're evolving by looking at what's in your schedule because it should be changing. Yeah. If it's the same thing all the time, you're not really evolving and growing. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, again, I think that business is a spiritual journey. It's not a physical one. Mm -hmm. And as you grow more, you can give more. Yeah. So like, I feel like for you with everything you just described, it's because you're in a massive season of growth. Mm-hmm but that's gonna allow you to give probably 10 times what you're currently doing, which could seem incomprehensible at the moment, mm -hmm. but it will come with that growth. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, um, the Bible talks about pruning, you know, and, and pruning isn't this thing where you're just getting rid of stuff for no reason. Pruning mm -hmm. is, hey, you know what? There's a lot of stuff going on here. I gotta go and cut some of these, these stems and everything else so that, the tree or the rose or whatever can grow far bigger because yes. if you leave all this stuff on the here, it's going to grow slow. It's not going to grow the right direction. Yeah. And you know, pruning is difficult because it, it, <laughs> it hurts it's painful. Yeah. Uh, you, you're getting, like I said, you're going to get rid of things that have made you money over the years. And you have to be willing to look at the new evidence, the new marketplace, the new innovations and say, yeah, am I willing to give, like you said, with your, you know, agent business, it's like, Am I willing to give this up after 2000 transactions to yeah. focus on this, which currently at the time is nothing. Yeah. Does not make what this <laughs> makes. No. So that's a big thing to give up, but I'll uh, just to give you, um, I guess, encouragement. Cause I freaking love it. I love when people take big risks like that. I did the same exact thing in 2020 when I decided to make content. Yeah. You know, I was, I was still going on seller appointments, just fully focused on my house living business. And I said, guys, I'm done going on seller appointments. I'm gonna go make YouTube videos. Yeah. And I'll tell and, and I'm gonna go make TikToks. And everybody was probably Dude, like, <laughs> everybody was like, you are an idiot. Yeah. Like, you're really gonna go make these kid videos mm -hmm. on TikTok. You're really gonna go start this YouTube channel and not close. You could go, you could easily make a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand dollars a month if you go close the deals because you're that good at closing compared to whoever else you're gonna put in yeah. charge of closing. Yeah. I said, yep. Yeah. And I heard a quote that says in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. So you saw something that others didn't. Mm -hmm. You saw a pattern. Yeah. And for you, you were willing to let go of something that was producing a meaningful amount of money to most. To most, they're like, dude, I'd be set. That's a meaningful amount of money to me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like a, a meaningful <laughs> amount of money. 200,000, 200,000. I don't, I don't yeah. blink at that. Yeah. So, um, and you were willing to let that go because you had the courage to follow a pattern. Yeah, you know, you it's it's faith, obviously. You gotta feel led um to and, go do it. Yeah, and I tell people like, you know, he didn't say like it, it's not like a, a tiptoe of faith. Yeah. It's a leap. Yeah. And when I picture a leap, it's like over like a ravine where I don't know if I'm gonna get to the other side. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't know. So I think that's what separates 
uh, I was watching this TikTok and a guy was saying he worked in private equity and he came from nothing and like, you know, worked his way up. And somebody asked him like, hey, what is the difference between people who produce very favorable outcomes, let's say in business or with wealth and people who don't? He said risk tolerance. And the guy was like, what do you mean? He's like, the guys that I play with are willing to go to negative 3 million until it pops. Most people, they're not willing to spend 2,000 yeah. bucks on content creation. Yeah. Or they'll ask you like, hey, Ryan, how do I know that if I spend 3,000, I'm going to make money? Like they're not, yeah. they're not jumping in faith. No. It's no. more like, you know, from a, a smaller perspective. Yeah. I call those people losers. Yeah. But anyways, so <laughs> no, it's just like, dude, you got to freaking risk it for the biscuit. That's yeah. the only saying I've got. You've got a million, but yeah. risk it for the biscuit. That's right. It's like, dude, <laughs> I've yet to meet one person who's achieved significant success, wealth, influence, who didn't take extreme risk to do it. That's right. Now, there are people who over time, they'll they'll build up their, their nest egg mm -hmm. year over year and they're great, right? And they'll, they'll become their own like local mini celebrity. Okay. I'm not talking about those people. You could become a multimillionaire, not taking huge risk. Correct. You can put away money every year and you'll be a slow. You could be a 401k millionaire. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm talking about rich, rich, yes. famous, famous, yes, true, big impact. Yeah. I'm talking about time freedom and location freedom. I'm talking about like where the only reason you do something is because you think it would be helpful or useful regardless of what it costs. Yeah. That's a different experience. Yeah. I said to my wife one time, we were on vacation and I was thinking, I'm like, can you imagine having residuals so much that you can't outspend it? Mm -hmm. Imagine what, the way you would think. You know what's weird is I've never thought about residuals in my entire career. I know. Yeah. Which I think is interesting because that's part of the conflict as we're having these conversations where you're looking at like uh, EXP and you're like, why did you do that? Yeah. Because you're thinking about <laughs> how much money can I make? Yeah, yeah. And what, what I'm thinking where my brain is, is dude, I invested 2 million bucks. I spent, you know how many houses you have to sit in? Yeah. You know how many times I want to burn my suit because they had a cat farm? Yeah. You know how many times I come home late to like listen yeah. for, I, I miss my kid's shit for that? My, my thing is I'm like, how do I make 2 million bucks this month? That's like how my mind operates. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, if nothing I'm doing right now could do that, is there something new I haven't thought about that can? Yeah. And I think what I, what I can learn from you is scale. Mm. So I'm thinking, how can I make a million dollars a year residually? Yeah. You're thinking, how can I make $2 million in the next 30 days? That's what I do. It's a different, yeah. It's a different way it's of It's a thinking. different thought process. Yeah, different thought process. Well, I'll tell you, so we just launched um, one of our new products and I'm super excited about it. The most excited I've been about a product in a really long time. So it's called our partner program. Mm -hmm. So the reason this product started is because um, a wealthy investor, we don't really have a low ticket coaching. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're anywhere from 10 to 30,000. And- you know, we're missing out on a, a, a huge chunk of people that maybe can only afford a few thousand, right? And so I said, okay, economically, how do you make this make sense? Because at a few thousand dollars, okay, let's just say 3,000 is the number. It's hard to make a successful business at that number. The moment you start spending ads, you got sales guys, you got infrastructure. That and the profit margin is not big enough that you can provide a fantastic experience. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. it's like, dude, I mean, if it costs 1500 bucks to acquire the customer and then you're going to give them this, this, and that, like it's hard to do it, which is why to this point, we haven't really focused on it. But I finally figured out a way to do it did where you? I was like, oh dude, this is going to crush. So what we did was we created this thing called the partner program. There's two levels. There's a three and a 5K. And essentially one of the, it, it solves one of the biggest problems of new real estate investors. And that is, how do I generate leads and how do I actually close the deal? Mm -hmm. Okay. So like in our other programs, we're teaching them everything. We're like, Hey, here's how you raise money, mm -hmm. contractors, all the stuff, build mm -hmm. teams, scale, sure. everything. This one is so dumbed down to it's that, Hey, we're actually going to give you a proprietary software that only you get. It's called our wealthy deal software. And it's got AI, it's got comping, it's got all that. It's included in the program already in the price. So you don't got to worry about paying for software. So you'll have everything you need. You don't need the MLS. You don't need any of that. Mm -hmm. We're gonna teach you how to use it to generate leads. From there, if you get a seller that says yes, we will literally close the deal for we'll you. We'll step in and close it for you. The partner side of it. Yeah. So we'll close the deal, okay? That way you eliminate the biggest hurdle that you have, which is you're probably gonna screw up the close because yeah. you don't know what you're doing, Yeah. right? And so now we're basically training all these people how to prospect, 
we're closing the deals, we're making money together. So now it becomes this thing where, well, we don't have to like make all this money on the front end selling this thing because we're going to make all this money on the back end Partnering. actually doing deals. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then from there, if we do deals together, what's the byproduct of all that? Well, one, eventually probably they're going to want to go learn to go do the full business themselves. Sure. So now they have capital to go into one of the other programs. Two, think about how many testimonials we're going to get from all these people 100%. who now do their first deal. Yeah. Three, from my house slipping company side, this is all net margin. Yeah. There's no marketing spend. They're doing it and we're partnering. And so when I think about this, I start running the numbers. I'm like, okay, what if we had a thousand people in this program, you know, within the next few months? Okay. If a thousand people are generating leads and everything else, sure. like even just like on a small level, what if 10% of them could do a deal, deal. a month? It's a hundred deals. That's a hundred deals. What's our average deal size right now? Our average deal at home run offers 37 K. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, that's three, that would be 3.7 million a month, a month. And so I just started revert and guess what? My marketing spend is zero is zero right now. There's a split, so I don't get the whole 3.7, but even if we were to just like bring the numbers down a little bit, I mean, this is a million, two million, three million dollar a month move with this program. Yeah, it's awesome. And so I'm just thinking about that and I'm like, holy crap, this is the freaking best product ever created. Yeah. Because it's there, there's no lose anywhere. Everybody has nothing to gain, like everything to gain. Yeah, it's interesting because in the real estate space, there are companies that have done that where they basically run the agent's team, but they keep 50% of all the money. Mm-hmm. So, but they, they, they run the CRM. Yeah. They, they handle the lead gen. Yeah. And, and my thing is like, I don't want people to be in it forever. Right. Versus the agent's team is like, yeah, you're going to be on the team forever, forever. Yeah. Right. That's why you're doing this. Yeah. Let's do a few deals together. Yeah. And then you do your own thing. Yeah. And maybe there's a mechanism in there where you graduate. Yeah. Like once you've done four or five deals or whatever, yeah. it's like, okay, cool. You're ready for the next program. Yeah, no, for sure. And some people will be sooner, some will be later. Yeah. But even like once you ascend, there's going to be plenty, like even our all-stars are looking at it and they're like, well, why wouldn't I just generate leads with a VA and use your team to close? And it's just like a passive stream for me. Yeah. Because they're like, well, I could just spend, let's just say three, 4,000 a month on a VA, generate you hundreds of leads and your team's got to handle them and close. I don't need to pay a sales guy. You are the sales guy. You are the sales team. And they're like, they're running their own numbers thinking this is actually a good opportunity even for me. Yeah. So anyways, we, um, you're talking about webinars. We did a three-day challenge um, last week and we had over 200 signups yeah. over the three days. Signups for that program mm -hmm. is dope. Good for you. Yeah. So it's awesome. Very exciting. Um, and that's a, that's a mixture of all of the stuff we've talked about. Yeah. So you've used the leverage of media. Yep which drives attention, yep. which fills a room. And then you've created a product that uses software. Mm -hmm. AI. <laughs> yeah, AI. Uh, so again, our capital, your capital, our labor. Your labor. They're so actually labor too. Right, so it's all forms of leverage. And yeah. that's why you're crushing it. And I, the reason is, is because, you know, there's another thing that's like, if you give me a lever long enough, I can move the earth. Mm. You're using four of them at the same time. Yeah. That's why people look at you and it looks like, bro, he's like Superman. How's he doing? <laughs> he's on peptides. He's why. on peptides, bro. <laughs> no, but it, you see what I'm saying? It's, yeah. it's because you're using all of these forms of leverage simultaneously. Right. And when you see these people, whether it's Grant, you know, who sits here or Brad or all of these other guys, they're using, and, and somebody like Grant is, he's using all forms of leverage at the same time. Yeah. Labor, capital, content, and code. For sure. All and at the same time. He's been doing it a long a time. A long time. And that's why he is where he is. Yes. And he, I mean, I feel like in many ways he led the way. In for that. sure. For sure. And he saw something before other people did. Well, I'll tell you. And by the way, for anyone who wants to join that program, I freaking would love to do your first deal with you. So you can go to wealthyinvestor.com and check it out. But um, with Grant, it's interesting because obviously he's been on the show a couple times and we've become friends. But he... I was reading the 10X rule last year yeah. for the first time in like, I don't know, it was released over 10 years ago. Yeah. I was like, man, let me see what this this book says today. Because I remember reading it when I was broke and I want to know how I would apply it today. Yeah. And also having context to knowing him now. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because in that book, he was talking about social media. And I think it was released in like 09. 
So he had just gotten crushed from the recession. Yeah. So I mean, like when he wrote that book, he wasn't like doing great. No, I mean, I he probably didn't have a ton of money. Yeah, and so not nearly what he has now. <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, I would even be surprised if he was a multimillionaire. Like, yeah. I, I would guess he he lost a lot during the recession, yeah. and maybe he was a millionaire. But nonetheless, he was talking about. He's like, "Yo, y'all need to start posting on Twitter." Facebook. He was just calling it out the whole time. He's like, this, this content thing is crazy. This it's is in thing. 2010. Yeah. He's like, I'm going all in on this. They don't charge you anything. Yeah. I'm just going to post like a madman. Yep. And I was sitting there reading it like, wow, dude, what great foresight this guy had. Yeah. He saw a pattern before everybody Nobody else. was doing it. And I watched him go. I remember Periscope. You remember Periscope? Yep. I watched him do that and become the biggest Periscoper like on the planet. And then that went away. And He's a perfect example of how, like, you know, I've done syndication deals with him, but I've never really bought any of his products, mm. which is interesting because the money that I've given him is substantially more than a $15 book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like substantially more. Yeah. And what, what that is, is uh, building, creating unmatched value over time through education. Yep. And you get to decide over time if you know, like, and trust this person. Mm-hmm. And to wire a hundred thousand dollars to somebody you don't even know. Yeah. That's a lot of trust that you've cultivated over time. Well, this is also why you joined, um, us with media. So it's like, you know, at the end of the day, our philosophy is in order to build trust at scale, people just need to spend time with you. Yeah. Right. So I was looking at our statistics on YouTube last month. It was our highest month ever. We had 180,000 hours of watch time, which is like, how many years? It's almost 20 years. <laughs> it's crazy. So in the last 30 days, people spent 20 years with me straight. Yeah. 24 seven. And there's, I think statistically you would know better than me, but I think it's like, if people consume 15 hours of your content with a super high degree of probability, they're going to engage with you in some way or do business with you in some oh, way. Oh, for sure. So think about at 20 years, how much goodwill, how much um, trust that you've cultivated over time. Yeah. And that's in the last 30 days. Yeah. So I'm just, you know, to your point, why you gave Grant so much money is you watched this guy for over 10 years. And by the time you started making some serious dough, right. you're like, all right, dude, I got to put this somewhere. I've been watching this guy for years. Yeah. Let me give it to this guy. That's right. Yeah. And then being on calls where he has his sister on the call who invested all of her money, like mm -hmm. her life savings with him or his mother-in-law on the call or all of his team members that have invested with him. I, I actually went to the facility as well, just to check it out and meeting all the people and seeing like what's going on. I, I walk the properties because a lot of them are in South Florida where I'm from. Yeah. So I'd pose like a tenant. And just like, <laughs> yeah. Just like walk around and see like, what is the deal here? And, uh, you know, when you combine those two things, that's what creates trust. Yeah. One thing I'll add too about him is, you know, a lot of people criticize the, the properties of, oh, this dude's overpaying for properties yeah. and everything. And I used to be one of those guys too, who thought that. And the more that I've been in the game, the more I realize like, no, you know, he understands that these A-class properties are the gems. They have the least amount of headache. Yeah. They're the safest. They may not look great on paper when no. you buy them, but over time, your risk is so low on so those. Low. And I heard one of the, uh, I think it's like the, the, the biggest broker of like multifamily in the, in the country. He has them speak at 10 X growth con. And he was like, dude, these functions like utilities, because when you have that many units, three to 500 units, let's say in one building, a, it comes with staff. So it's a business. Yeah. B the rents, uh, like leases are up 8% of them every month. So you can raise rents and lower them according to the market. So it's like a utility. So you ask a question, do you think that a utility is going to go out of business? And the answer is like, no. <laughs> so that's why it's one of the safest places on planet Earth to park money. And that's why um, insurance companies park money there. Yep. And, you know, uh, um, you know, major hedge funds and large institutions. So the other thing I think is happening, Ryan, is people don't understand the real game that he's playing, which I believe that the real game that he's playing is his goal is to amass 20,000, 25,000 units and either convert it into a REIT on Wall Street or to sell the whole package at one time. That is his game. He's told me. Yeah. Because what yeah. he, what I'm aware of is he's solving a problem. So the black streets are like the whatever, uh, Blackstone uh, of the universe and all these hedge funds, they don't want a $300 million building. It doesn't even move the needle. 
No. It doesn't even change anything. They need something big enough that it actually makes a difference because they have endless amounts of money. Yep. So he's solving a problem. I'm going to put together all these trophies, A plus, like you like them. Yep. And in 10 years or 15 years, when I'm ready to do my thing, I will sell it. And what I told him on a conference call one time, uh, I was like, hey, bro, when you do that, I'm going to have a picture of Grant in my house and I'll be like, as I like, <laughs> walk by, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because he's doing all that work. Yeah. While I'm just like, Chilling. Chilling. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. And the thing is, when you're innovating, you're you're going to be criticized until you're right. Yeah. And well, and people go through a process. So first they laugh at you. Then they call you crazy. Then they say you're a crook. Mm -hmm. You got to be stealing from people. Then you know what they do? They call you for advice. Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining like when you did, you're like, hey guys, I'm going to walk away from this thing and do the TikTok thing yeah. and the YouTube thing. Everybody's like, you're crazy. Yeah. They laughed at you. Yeah. Right. Then they're like, man, like, what is he doing? Is that like legit? And now when you're in a room, what do they want? Advice. Advice. Mm -hmm. How do I do it? So you just have to have the intestinal fortitude that like, once you, you've, you've done the thinking, you've recognized the patterns to be like, yeah, like I know this is the way. You know, I tell Jose sometimes, you know, like the Mandalorian, like, this is the way. <laughs> it's like, this is the way. Yeah. And then you got to just. But but you got to, I mean, dude, it's hard because even just take a guy like Grant, like, you know, he's been saying this stuff about social media. Okay. He was right. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Now he's buying up all these properties and yeah. people are like, oh, he's stealing money, mm -hmm. this crap. And we won't know if he's right until. It ends, right? Yeah, because, until he sells it. Yep. Because until now, like it's not going to make a ton of money. That's just how syndications are. Because people are like, dude, his returns are like freaking nothing. They're three, four, five percent. Yeah. It's like, well, yeah, that's just is what it is yeah. until it sells. The sell is the big payday. Yeah. That and when you see the quality of asset. Yeah. Because I am I mean, again, like the majority of his portfolio is in South Florida where I live. Yeah. And I know those guys really well. I've had uh, Ryan Secco. He spoke at a mastermind that we run. He's the vice president of Cardinal Capital. And when I go to these assets, like me and you would live there, dude. These are A plus amenities are ridiculous. This isn't B or C product. No. This is like top of the top of the top of the top. So if I'm receiving five to 6%, I'm like, yeah, dude, like I, could I get 4% in the bank right now? Yes. I'm also aware that with this, I participate in the in the waterfall event. Yep. I get distributions. I also get, um, as an LP, I get uh, depreciation. Yep. So the majority of that income is tax free. Yep. I don't have to do anything. I can just focus on making impact. I can focus on things that like I enjoy, right? And again, if you can get the residual, I think people have like silly numbers in their head and it annoys me. So you ask somebody like, yeah, bro, I wanna, I wanna do like 50 million. I'm like, dude, like let's work on getting $10,000 in the bank. Right? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? And they don't do the math on that. Yeah. They don't understand in order to get 50, you gotta do a hundred. Right. So if you do the math, and again, I'll circle back to that, like $10,000 a month residually. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, like not, like housing, transportation, food, and insurance is covered. And I think it's completely within everybody's grasp to invest in yourself, earn a meaningful amount of money, yep. become a credit investor, be able to participate in investment, like institutional grade assets that 10 years ago, before that law was passed, that Obama passed, me and you would never have access to it. Right. Because they couldn't, they couldn't um, advertise it. Mm -hmm. It was a good old boy network. And you couldn't stroke a check for like 50 or 100. You had to stroke a check for like 10 million just to get in the deal. <laughs> right. It's like unbelievable, like what's available to us. So people like they poo poo it, but they don't recognize like, dude, that's like an unbelievable opportunity. And he didn't have to do it. He could have he could have just done deals with his boys. Like he didn't have to do that. Yeah. Well, you know, too, I tell people this because you were saying earlier, like, hey, I might be able to get a better return if I do it myself. And it might be true for you because you're a real estate guy. Yeah. But for most, it's like, no, actually you would get a worse return. Worse. Doing it on your own. Yeah. You don't know what you're doing. At all. <laughs> and and you will you will get an education. You weren't, you won't get a return, you'll get an education because you'll have to learn the, the hard way yeah. all the problems. And I think it's kind of ego, you know? So yeah. what I've done, it's interesting because it made me feel really good because I heard Hermosi, he did a, a, a talk on it and he said he talked to a billionaire and the billionaire told him like when he sold his company and exited, to do a couple things with money. One is index funds, which people don't like. They're not sexy, right? But when you study and you read a random walk down Wall Street, you read uh, The Simple Path to Wealth, there's various different reasons why it tilts the odds in your favor as a mechanism for building wealth long-term over time. If you get a 7% return, 2% uh, dividends, 5% growth, 
it'll double every 10 years. Now, that's not sexy to a lot of people because like, no, I want to fast, I want it now. At the same time, it works. And for most people, that's probably what they should do. Yeah. Because they have no idea. You're trying, you mean to tell me, like think about the audacity, like the hubris to think that you can outwit hedge funds that have computing power at their disposal and unfathomable, um, unlimited supplies of money that you can beat them at a game that they own. Yeah. It's like, that's not even, that's, that's not a realistic expectation. So, you know, putting money into index funds and then using syndications, I think is a really awesome mechanism for most people to build wealth. Yep. And then get really good at something. Yep. And Naval said another thing that really blew my mind. He said, yo, if you want to get paid in the future, you need to live in the future. Mm. So you need to get really good at something and brand it around your name, mm. which is what you've done. Mm. It's what I'm in the process of doing. It's getting really good at one thing, branding it around your name. And that will basically in perpetuity ensure that you'll be fine. You, you know, one thing I'll say with what you're saying and what, you know, I, a lot of people fail to comprehend is your belief in, you know, what's going to happen in the future and yeah. how it has to play out is very strong. Mm -hmm. And so you have conviction to ride out however long it takes Yes, because most people don't have the conviction. They're like, I agree with you guys what you're saying, but after three months it doesn't work. And they're like, yeah, you know, yeah. freaking it was a scam. Yeah. Um, and so you got to have conviction to get to the future. Agreed. Right. When I hear about, you know, I'm a big uh, believer in crypto, right? It's like, man, these guys who were talking about Bitcoin 10 years ago, they had such conviction. Yeah. It was, it was less than a dollar. Yeah. Like, no, dude, this is the legit, yeah. right? And even today, I, I believe Bitcoin's going to be, you know, multi six figures. Yeah. I don't know when it's going to be. Sure. I believe it'll be a million dollars one day. Yeah. I don't know how long. But you got to have the conviction to write it out. Yeah, and for sure the uh, so what I what I told myself this year is I want to read. I want to spend a hundred hours because I think if you spend a hundred hours on a topic, you'll know more than ninety five percent of the population. Yeah. So what I see is I see the underlying technology of blockchain, for sure. Yeah. I also have gone as I was reading that book. So I'm reading books about blockchain and reading books about smart contracts. And you know more about this because you've done types and everything. And you're kind of forward thinking in that way yeah, and attaching it to utility. And I had an experience where in order to reclaim, let's say my Apple ID, because I forgot it, what I had to go through to confirm I am who I say I am, as I'm reading those books, I'm like, oh dude, like an NFT will solve that problem. <laughs> yeah. Like this. Yeah. And now every time I have to show my ID somewhere, I'm like, this is fucking lame. Yeah. This is antiquated. Why are we still doing it this way? Or when I look at blockchain with let's say real estate transactions, what's crazy is, I can know where my Chipotle order is within minute increments on my phone, but nobody can tell me when closing is. Yeah. How does that make sense? Right. And why does it take 45 days to close? Like I start to see in the future, like, wow, with blockchain, let's say you have everything that's ever gone wrong with that property on the chain. Mm -hmm. Every inspection, anything that's, so I don't even need to do a home inspection. Yeah. I just go in there. I look at the chain. I see what's up. I see all the things that have been pulled. I make you an offer, that process will shrink from 30 to 45 days to five. Yeah. Right? And title companies will have a problem. Yeah. Because that, that, that whole standing in the middle and facilitating the transaction, like they're not really- Oh, I've, yeah. I've said it forever. Title companies are toast in the long run. So it's just a matter of when. Yeah. Right? And, and I think by, by, by exposing yourself to that, you can start to notice patterns. Yeah. And you're very good at that. So you notice the patterns and then you go, whoo. and sometimes you notice a pattern. Like you said, you shut businesses. And I saw your video, by the way, and I thought it was pretty dope mm -hmm. that you had like the courage. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people were like, probably like, don't do that. Yeah. But you had the courage to show up fully and completely be like, nope, I'm the leader. Yep. This is what I did. Mm -hmm. Didn't work out. So what I thought it was going to work out. Yep. And here's where we're going. And that takes a lot of courage to do that. So I definitely want to acknowledge you for that. Yeah. I appreciate that. But you saw the pattern. Yeah. And you saw a bunch of, and a bunch of dudes you run with, yep. it was working mm -hmm. and they were making a lot of money. Yep. And you're like, okay, we can do this too. Yep. But then it stopped. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you continue to expose yourself to, uh, what's happening and what's upcoming, 
you can again start to notice patterns and then have the courage to move forward with them. I went to uh, the real the thing that really got me on this, Ryan, was I went to Tony Robbins Business Mastery like four years ago. It literally melted like my brain. <laughs> he brought a technologist on stage mm -hmm. and he talked about the process of humanization where he said, so I'm a little older than you, I'm 42, mm -hmm. but he's like, how many of you guys remember that there used to be someone at the toll booth? And everybody's like, yeah. And then it went from somebody at the toll booth, they, they were there and a change machine. Then it went to no toll booth, just the change machine. Mm -hmm. Now it's a responder that goes on your car. And he said, in every single industry, that is what's in the process of happening. Right. Right now, as we speak. Mm -hmm. And that got me like, whoa. And I was just selling real estate. I was doing some consulting. I was like, dude, I need to really start to think differently. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%, dude. It's Look, at the end of the day, if you want to stay in business, so, I mean, not to keep bringing Grant up, but we have a TV show coming out that um, he's producing. Oh, really? That's and, awesome. And um, it's called Rise and Fall. Okay. I don't know how much I'm allowed to say, but anyways, it's about the rise and fall of businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we filmed eight episodes and um, it was really good. I, I, filming it, was very just like learning a ton about the rise and fall of these different businesses. And so, you know, I can't say which companies they were, but these are all multi-billion dollar companies mm -hmm. that had quick ascensions and then, you know, or now no longer. Yeah. And with that, it occurred to me, I was like, man, every single one of them fell because they didn't innovate. Yes. They were the top dog and doing their thing. And then all of a sudden change started to happen and they thought that their top dog status would yes. be enough. And it's like, nah, dude, you got to pivot. You got to adapt. If you don't, doesn't matter how long you've been in business, you'll be out of business yeah, because, tomorrow. And the, to, to really hammer that point home, I think it's like of all the companies in the S&P 500 over the last hundred years, there's only like four or five of them that are still in existence. Right. That shows you how relentless and unforgiving markets are. Yeah. They really don't care. And the two things I tell people regularly, and really I think people teach what they need, what they need. So a lot of what I'm saying here is more like it's, for me. <laughs> you got to re retell at, yourself it? At this stage, you know what I'm saying? So the most expensive thing you can own is a closed mind. Mm. And when I ask people a question, like if I'm doing a talk, I'll say, hey, how do you think people see? And they'll be like, well, with your eyes. I'm like, well, what if I told you that's not how you see? What if I told you it's your mind that sees? It uses your eyes as a mechanism to see. So what's really true is if my mind is blind to the possibility, my eyes will be blind to the opportunity. Mm. there will literally be something right in front of me that could be enormous and I won't see it. So the challenge is, is to, you know, remain open. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, just ask questions. Like, well, what I thought was really cool is like when you walked in, you start asking questions to Jose, you start, Hey man, what are you doing? What's going on? Like, it's not like, Hey, this is what I'm doing and it's really working. And like, you guys should do what I'm doing. That's not what it is at all. So it's remaining open and triangulating ideas of believable people, people that are producing favorable outcomes because they must see something that you don't. That's yep. the truth. Yep. They, must, they must have a mental map or a vision or they are seeing something that you are not seeing. That's why they're doing what they're doing. Right. Yeah, for me, I'm always asking questions yeah. nonstop because I'm trying to learn and just whatever's on the horizon, I want to know. Yeah, and the other thing that's really cool, what I noticed is like you're also, because you've been doing this for a while, but you're not afraid to like speak up. You're like, hey, this is what I think is true. And then it's like, well, tell me something different. Yeah. You know disprove what I'm saying? me. Yeah, disprove me. Like, like, here's what I think with conviction. Yep. But then not like you're also open. Like, hey, tell me what you're why are you doing that attraction thing? Is it worth your time? Da 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 da. -da right. Mm -hmm. And you're you're I feel from you that you're sincerely open to perhaps changing your mind. Oh, for sure. And what I'm aware of is I think that things are moving so fast. I think 30 years ago, you could get away with knowing one thing. Yeah. Forever. For like your whole life. <laughs> yeah. Legit. Where now they're moving so fast, so quick that there's two skills that are the most important. One is the ability to learn things fast, quick. Second is, is a willingness to change your mind. Mm. And that second one is so hard. Yeah. I had a guy I was coaching and he decided to make a decision and you know, I gave him guidance against it, but he was convinced that he was right. And then, you know, maybe eight months later, nine months later, it's playing out the way that I imagined it would. And that's not me like being like, I told you so. Yeah. 
just like an accurate assessment of reality. And what I told him on the calls, I'm like, look, one of three things need to happen here. One, you need to out, you need to produce your way out of this because he built out a space, got a bunch of staff, yeah. and then he recognized, he make oh, revenue. Yep. the staff isn't producing any revenue. Mm -hmm. And he, he started to hemorrhage money. So I'm like, one, you need to put your head down and produce your way out of this. Two, you need to radically expand your team. Yeah. You need way more people. Or three, you need to admit, admit that you were wrong. Yeah, just close shop. Yeah, and here's what's interesting. That third one, brother, it may, it's so hard. It may take you a year. Yeah. And you might bleed out. Mm-hmm. Right? It's tough. It's hard to yeah. be like, I'm sure it's hard for you to look at the, like, let's say the commerce business, like, yep, got to cut it. Or hard for you to look at other business, like, it's time to sell it. Yeah. That's hard. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. So I think ability to learn things fast and change your mind. Yeah. Yeah, as we wrap up, the two things I'll say about that is, one, with changing my mind, I always, and my employees are used to it now, but just, you know, take like a big new business out of it, just day-to-day -day decisions. I'll be like, I'll ask them many, many questions that could seem like, I guess, like an attack, Yeah. but it's just more so like, no, I'm going to pick apart your idea. Yeah. And if you can defend it, then we know it's a good idea. If you can't, then there's a flaw yes. and we need to reshift it. Right. So asking the right questions helps you change your mind. Yes. Two is in terms of learning, I actually did a video on this. I think my best skill is the ability to learn. And I don't think it's real estate. I don't think it's social media. Those are just skills I learned really quick. And I just look back at my life and I'm like, man, how many skills have I learned that would be considered world-class? And you're like, all right, okay, real estate, social media. I played pro baseball, you know, I'm pursuing golf. Uh, and I've learned it really quick. Um, you know, we throw events world-class yeah. already. We, you know, delegate, we, we run ads and marketing. I'm trying to build a world-class sales team. It's like, you don't just learn those skills out of the blue. Mm -mm. You have to be very intentional with how you learn a skill, which that that's a whole different topic for another podcast. But like, there is an inherent skill to learning. I agree. hundred percent. And I think that the more you can um, spend time intentionally in that space, you can stack skills, which is what you're doing. And as you stack skills, you become more valuable. Mm. So you don't become, you, like you don't get more because you want more. You, be get, you get more because you become more. Mm. And people want to short circuit that. They don't want to become. Yeah. But you're stacking skills. So what I've, I've shared with people, it's similar, but different. So like, okay, first I learned how to, list property in high volume, that's a skill. But then I learned how to work with probates. Yep. That's a valuable skill. Then I learned how to invest money to create financial freedom and independence, that's a skill. Mm -hmm. Now I've learned social, that's a skill. Yep. Like now I do speaking of regulation, that's a skill. Yep. Now I've attracted, you know, a bunch of people in a short period of time, that's a skill. I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I'm stacking skills. And as you stack them, you become more valuable. And to go full circle, if I spend time futzing around with investments, I can't stack skills. At a and, rapid speed. And the key is you stack the skills one at a time. Yes. You're not trying to stack all those simultaneously. That's right. That's where people get mixed up. Yeah, they want to do everything at once. Yeah. yeah. And I'm the same way. I focus on a skill and I, I don't think about anything else until I feel like I've mastered that skill to the degree at which I'm happy with. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Well, dude. This has been a great conversation. You For know, sure. we said, hey, we got a realtor on. I said, man, dude, what are, <laughs> what are we going to do here? Yeah. How many houses is he going to tell me he sold? Like, what next? Yeah. But dude, just to hear, uh, you know, your your thought process, it very much aligns with how I think. And I think it's amazing, dude. So for anybody who's interested in working with you, how do they find you? Yeah, they can find me uh, on Instagram at Aaron Novello. Cool. Yeah. So guys, we'll link to that down below. Go check it out. If you're trying to join a downline, go join his downline. He's obviously providing a ton of value. So if you want to go in EXP, hit him up. And uh, make sure you subscribe for the next one. We'll see you later. Peace. His first year being a realtor, he made over a million dollars with just doing YouTube. And it's not like he had like hundreds of thousands of subscribers on YouTube. He did it with 7,000 subscribers. I was 41.